Uh, it is now six o'clock, so I will go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Diana Taishu. I am moderating this evening's uh, discussion. Um, this is my first virtual lecture at the Cincinnati Preservation Association as Outreach Manager. I just started last week, so we're really hitting the ground running. And not only is this my first virtual lecture, but this is the first virtual lecture that CPA has put on. And we're so excited that uh, you are all here and that you've supported CPA uh, through kind of weird times over the past couple months. So uh, thank you for that and thank you for coming this evening. Just to, to put a plug in for future events, this is the first of what we hope are many virtual lectures over the next couple of months. We actually have one coming up very soon. I will share more details about that at the end of the lecture. Um, that is going to be on Cincinnati's oldest buildings. So you don't want to miss out on that. We'll share more details about it and you'll also get a link uh, to that invite later this week. Uh, Paul Muller is our executive director here at the Cincinnati Preservation Association. He is also uh, the principal of Muller and has been an architect for a long time, longer than he's been with CPA. Uh, and so tonight he's going to be putting on that architect hat and walking us through the history of Isaiah Rogers' work, the places he connected with the people and the stories um, that are all connected with with who Isaiah Rogers was. So we're going to learn a lot tonight um, and I'm going to hand things over to you, Paul. Uh, welcome, everybody. It is really great to see you, if, even if I'm only seeing all of your names. I'm realizing how much I'm going to relish being back at uh, events with people when this is over. I'm sure we all share that. Um, and thanks to Diane for uh, setting this up. Um, I am just going to start right in, and hopefully we do more of these in the future. Okay, so we're going to talk about Isaiah Rogers. Um, He's a really interesting figure uh, nationally, and particularly here in Cincinnati. His career intertwined with Cincinnati's emergence as a major American city uh, in an era that Roger had a significant impact on. Uh, he was, uh, you know, he's, he's of Cincinnati, but he's also uh, very important nationally. And uh, we'll see that as we follow his career through here. Um, Okay, we've got a lot of material tonight, and I have to say I drew a lot of it from James F. Gorman's wonderful book, Isaiah Rogers, uh, Architectural Practice in Antebellum uh, America. Um, he wrote it in 2015, he based it on the rediscovered diaries of Isaiah Rogers. Rogers kept meticulous notes, uh, everything he did, and there were volumes and volumes of these, which uh, became really important. Uh, Denny Myers found these, and they were able to identify many buildings by Rogers that uh, people just didn't know were his. I highly recommend the book. I think everybody should buy it. That way my drawing from it so uh, relentlessly will be uh, compensated for. Um, so Rogers was born in Marshfield, Massachusetts, and his career spanned basically 1824 to his death in 1869. This means that he was rising to prominence at a time when the practice of architecture was just emerging as a recognized profession. There really weren't many professional architects at the time. And um, in 1822, I'm sorry, I have some confusing uh, parts on my screen that I'm trying to get rid of. Oh, we're still sharing, right? I am very sorry. Um, yes, we can still see it. If I take a little time here to fix this, it will be worth it. Okay, uh, there really weren't very many architects uh, at the time in 1822 when he started. Uh, and he, he went from Mansfield to uh, Boston and entered the office of uh, Willard, uh, I, I'm sorry, Solomon Willard, who was a leading architect in New England. Willard also ran quarries and uh, quarried the stone uh, from Quincy, Massachusetts that was used in a lot of his buildings. And a lot of people think of this as Boston granite. Uh, but um, Isaiah Rogers got experience uh, both in the study of architecture and in uh, stone quarrying and construction from uh, Solomon Willard. And he admired him. He was so grateful to him the rest of the life. He even named one of his uh, children, Solomon Will Willard Rogers, who joined him in practice later. Uh, but this combination of architectural design and construction uh, actually made Rogers stand out a bit from his uh, contemporaries at the time. 
As the profession emerged, many architects sought to enhance the distinction between architect and general contractor. And Rogers never did that. He wanted to build his uh, buildings himself, which he did. And um, so this is just a quick little display to give you a, uh, an idea of the breadth of his practice. Uh, he was traveling all of the time. And there were ways to travel then, which were train and uh, riverboat. He would be in one city one day and another the next. And um, I was always surprised. He would meet somebody on Wednesday and go to a couple of different cities, but have their designs for them on, by Monday. Um, still don't quite know how that works. But here is a course of about uh, 50 years of his life. I've only highlighted the major projects. Uh, the map probably could have been full if we'd done all of them. But you can see it starts to cluster around Cincinnati and then toward the end, Washington, DC, and then back to Cincinnati. And so those are the locations of uh, his major projects. He, wor he worked in the South, uh, around Cincinnati, Louisville, Washington, DC, and a lot of other cities. Now, uh, we won't spend a lot of time on this slide, but I realized after giving like a practice talk to a couple of people, uh, a lot of terms came up and it was a little uh, hard to keep track of. So I, this is just a quick a cliff note uh, take on architectural styles that might come up in the course of it. But uh, neoclassicism, the classical revival, or something that people are pretty familiar with, it's architecture that was inspired by the ancient buildings of Rome and Greece. It was popularized by Jefferson. And then it eventually grew into, in America, the uh, Greek Revival architecture. And, you know, we've considered that we were taught in grade school that Greek Revival architecture was chosen because it um, aligned with uh, democracy and democracy uh, having its origins in Greece. Uh, I think architectural historians are starting to question that now. And it was a universal, uh, more, much more universal and widespread uh, architectural movement that had to do with discoveries that were being made and the convergence of uh, ideas coming out of the Enlightenment about um, uh, the values of uh, the classics. At any rate, Isaiah Rogers was not the first architect to practice in the Greek Revival, but over the course of his career, he was probably one of the most uh, uh, prolific and uh, is highly associated with it. He did work in other uh, styles when clients or the conditions demanded it, such as the Gothic Revival, for churches or meeting halls. And in, toward the end of his career, uh, Italianate architecture uh, comes into play a bit too. And occasionally he did things in Egyptian revival, uh, which was popular in the 1820s and 30s for cemeteries and theaters. Uh, the Napoleonic Wars had stimulated a lot of interest in um, uh, Greek revival, or I mean, Egyptian architecture. Uh, I, I didn't include a few of his in there, but I should have. Um, Okay, so in the early 19th century, there really weren't very many professional architects in the United States. The ones that are here, uh, the sort of primary ones had immigrated from Europe, such as Benjamin Henry Latrobe and John Holman. Holman did the White House, which is shown here, uh, burned by the British, uh, thanks, Britain, uh, in, eight, uh, after, in the War of 1812, and uh, St. John's Episcopal Church, by Latrobe uh, sitting in front of it just across Lafayette Park. So these two buildings uh, helped really set neoclassicism uh, as a, a style for America. And they were done by architects, as I said, who were trained in Europe. The other route for uh, aspiring architects in America was through self-education and apprenticeship. Rogers uh, had come from a fairly well-established family in Massachusetts that had been in the shipbuilding business for uh, generations. Uh, and, but when he was 16 years old, he um, moved to Boston to become a carpenter. Uh, he studied that for a few years and he developed skill in architecture by drawing local buildings, by studying books, and then by finally working with Boston architect builder Solomon Williams, Solomon Willard, sorry, as I mentioned before. He only worked there for a few years, I think maybe two, but he was uh, grateful to him his entire life and bought granite from him for most of his projects. Um, one of the books that Rogers would have had available to him to study was uh, The Antiquities of Athens. It was published in 1762 by Stuart and Revit. And this book provided an orderly guide to Greek architecture. Um, 
and it became probably the most influential book in architecture in the era. Its illustrations and demarcations of the classical order contributed immensely to the emergence of neoclassicism and later Greek revival. And um, uh, Isaiah Rogers had a real skill at this at a young age, well, 27. And what, one of the nice things about Rogers, he was born in zero. So you can always keep track of what his age was without much math. But uh, the, this is the Tremont Theater of 1827. It was one of his first major successes. He'd only been on his own for a year after leaving uh, Willard's office. It was in Boston. He entered the competition. It was a very high level competition. The people who were sponsoring it were uh, the uh, intellectual and uh, wealthy elite of Boston. He won uh, with this drawing, it's ink wash. And uh, Gilbert Stewart was actually on the port famous portrait painter, was on the jury and was one of the judges. And he actually noted on the back of this drawing, uh, I'm gonna read this, it says, uh, uh, he did not see that the front of the building admits to a better distinction. So I guess for 1827, that's a pretty big compliment. At any rate, it was very well uh, received. And um, as you can see, it uh, adheres to uh, the principles of classicism in uh, a relatively sophisticated way for uh, this time period. Uh, the theater was built under the supervision of Rogers and his career uh, really moved up to a new level from doing small houses for people around uh, the Boston area. Um, another competition the next year led to Rogers winning the uh, right to design, to design and build the Tremont House. This is considered the first grand hotel in America, 1828, 1829. Uh, it was right across the street from the Tremont Theater and it, it uh, really built upon a success. I mean, this, this was a major uh, accomplishment. He was again, 28 years old. It set him on a course to build hotels throughout the entire country. The success of the Tremont House led Rogers to become known as the father of the American hotel. And it set a new standard for hotels uh, with many firsts, such as indoor plumbing. And uh, it had an enormous stained glass rotunda that was supported by 12 ionic columns, had gas lighting, call bells, fireproofing. Some of these had existed in other hotels, but all of them uh, were advanced and some were actual innovations at the Tremont House. Uh, it's kind of interesting. It makes me think about the Terrace Plaza. The Tremont House was considered the first modern hotel. Well, uh, and it introduced all these innovations. Well, you know, we have the uh, Terrace Plaza as the first modest hotel of another iteration with uh, those kind of innovations too. But uh, the owner of the Tremont, William Elliott, uh, published a monograph which described it in great detail. It was an entire book just on the hotel. And it made Rogers famous across the nation. It was the first architectural monograph, which became a type of publication architects would use to promote themselves and get commissions. Uh, Rogers was grateful to Elliot for the rest of his life and even said near the end that it all, it all came from Elliot, having promoted him so relentlessly. Um, from an architectural standpoint, the Doric simplicity uh, on this building worked really well with the hard New England granite. It's a case where the building material and the architectural style work in harmony with each other. And this isn't an accident, it's something Roger sought out his entire career, an integration of material, function, and style. Uh, he was, uh, e even though he's working in these styles, whenever he criticized anyone else's work, it would be for the function or the construction or the layout. Uh, he never really, openly discuss stylistic concerns, but he handled them very well in his own work. Uh, it wasn't that he wasn't skilled at it. Um, but anyway, the Doric portico has 37 foot tall columns that are single blocks of granite. Uh, it was very difficult to move them from the quarry and even that became a design uh, problem that had to be solved. But the simplicity of this really match the current mood of the country. You know, sometimes there's a feel that kind of goes with what people are looking for. And that's why this Greek revival style became so popular. Um, and uh, it's really hiding how complex the hotel is and the complex location because the streets are not in a grid at, the, at this location. And uh, we'll see in a minute what um, Isaiah Rogers did to 
uh, deal with that. But uh, William Elliott, the owner of it, spoke at the groundbreaking. It's really interesting because they invited the trade workers to come to the groundbreaking, which it was a high society affair, and that was kind of unusual. But and I'm not going to subject you to reading what he said, but it's fun to read it in the language of the time. But he spoke uh, that his hope was that the benefits that were going to come from this wonderful creation, this work of art, would uh, imbue to the workers who had made it. And uh, for 1828, uh, that was a very uh, unusual progressive idea. Here we are with the plan of the hotel. And if you're like I am, I mean, I think you might be surprised that that building you know, ends up having this plan. But again, it's uh, Isaiah Rogers' skill as an architect to achieve that uh, simplicity with such a complex program and a complex site. Um, there, the two different grids are resolved. And um, I'm going to show you a couple of ways he does that. But um, let's see if I. We have these columns on the front, which are really the only ornament running across the uh, main facade of the building. And then they lead to this rotunda, which was covered with a stained glass dome that was uh, really advanced uh, for its time to be able to have such a large public space. And uh, going in there must have been really amazing. And then we see at the ends of the building, these two shallow bays, and we're going to keep seeing that in Roger's work throughout, and it lands on Dayton Street in the uh, George Hatch House that we'll have a little bit later in the talk, but I just wanted to point them out here as a, um, an early use of them. But uh, Rogers is dealing with the uh, central axis going up the grand staircase, and then the cross axis, very straightforward, simple planning devices. But then he has to adapt that to this skewed grid. And he does it in two different ways in this uh, design. As you see over in the hotel room section, it's done in a way that makes a very private connection between the public spaces and the more private room areas. And he gets one of his uh, signature staircases as part of this swirl, spatial swirl that makes the knuckle at the point. And at the other end, the staircase receives the axis and uh, spins around, but the openings come into a grand hall that's much more inviting, much more open. And it's really seamless. You wouldn't, if you were moving through these spaces, I don't think you would really be aware that he had negotiated these conflicting uh, urban grids in such a graceful way. And just to um, make the point even more because there was no one to stop me, I put these in here to show how he gets the transition on that side, sort of closing it off, making it private, and the other side, which is inviting and much more public. Um, planning these can be very hard. You end up with funny little spaces. Um, he did pretty well in uh, making all the spaces work to his purpose. And then we didn't have photography, but fortunately we had the artist, Harry Phillip, who painted the Tremont House and the Tremont Theater. I'm not sure I mentioned they were across the street from each other. But uh, talk about a start to your career. Two of the most important buildings in Boston to go up during this era. And you get to do them both. You get to build them and you get to use your granite from your friend's quarry. Uh, not only that, but there's a cemetery that we're seeing in the foreground. And uh, the cemetery hired him to redesign the fencing. And he put a gate to it in the uh, Egyptian revival style. I had to cut some things, uh, so I'm not showing you that. But you can look it up. At the same time, he was also working in other styles, as I said, like the Gothic Revival, when a client or the program called for it. Here are two examples in Boston, a Masonic temple and a, the first parish church in Cambridge. And if you look at them, they just look less resolved. You know, it's interesting that uh, uh, he had so much uh, success in his composition and, and uh, working within the um, Greek Revival style. but uh, when I look at these buildings, I, they just didn't, they, they just didn't look very uh, uh, skilled. They didn't look like they were resolved and that the parts had a uh, harmonic relationship among them. And then I found out in reading a little bit more, even, uh, the, crit the critics at the time felt the same way. There are some very funny reviews of them that say no form of architectural style has survived uh, to be built in these buildings. But um, 
he did it and he went back to classicism uh, as much as he could and when he had complete control of the situation. For example, his entry into the Girard College uh, competition uh, is completely classical and uh, even Palladian in some ways. And he lost this and you know, he, he knew all of the other architects at the time, it was a small group, but Thomas Hugh Walters uh, won this competition. He even traveled to, uh, when he traveled to F Philadelphia, he met with Walters and noted in his diary that Walters' scheme was very good. I'm not sure he said it was better, but saying it's very good to when you lost to, that's, that's pretty good. Um, he did not design this building, which is the, the old state house in Boston. It goes back to pre-revolutionary uh, time, but he was hired to uh, renovate the interiors of it, which he did in a Greek revival style. And notably, he added this incredible spiral staircase. Now, um, I haven't seen this in the literature and maybe you know, I need to dig a little deeper, but these staircases that he did were astonishing. And I wonder if some of that might come from his family's shipbuilding legacy. Uh, I might be reaching too far, but it's Zoom, so I can, I can do that, I guess. Um, by the way, it's hard to do this without visual feedback or um, being, I would love to give this talk in a room where everyone was there. Um, at any rate, I'll keep pushing through with my first talk. But uh, the staircase uh, is, is really uh, spectacular. Uh, you can see it here, and it's uh, one of his uh, works that survives, which is, which is nice. We, we end up with not very many of his buildings because, first of all, they were built in the centers of cities, which churn their architecture due to scale and obsolescence of function. And um, a lot of buildings burned. At, um, uh, from this time period. But anyway, here's the staircase. And I, I thought I'd put this in just since we're on the um, old state house in Boston. Uh, this is uh, a lot of times our buildings serve as stages or backdrops or settings for the most important things that happen in society. And I think, you know, um, the Boston, uh, Boston massacre happened right in front of the old state house. And um, it was the first uh, action of the Revolutionary War, where uh, Christmas Addicts was the first person to be uh, killed in that war. Just thought I'd get them in there, to get um, the Revolutionary War. Uh, and the relationship between buildings, it's, uh, it comes up again and again in history. Um, he was hired shortly after that to design a, the house for uh, Captain Robert Forbes in Milton, Massachusetts. And Forbes made his fortune in uh, shipping and trade with China. And I think there might be a little hint of marine architecture in the house. Uh, it's been altered and I am not certain. I, I've looked at a lot of the uh, early photographs and drawings, but uh, some of this is Isaiah Rogers work and some is our later additions. I know the windows on the attic level were round in the original Isaiah Rogers design. So, Again, that would add a little bit more to the nautical theme of the building. Uh, keep this one in mind later when we land in Aurora, Indiana, and you'll uh, maybe see a few things that connect it. Uh, Forbes also got his uh, Isaiah Rogers stairway, goes all the way through the house to the cupola, and uh, the geometry involved in these is really uh, sophisticated, and it's, uh, he certainly seemed to make, like to make sure everyone got one. And here's the barn at the uh, Forbes house. It's now a museum. Um, and uh, they restored this, uh, this Isaiah Rogers barn recently. It's kind of interesting to see him working in a vernacular utilitarian structure. I would like to have seen more of, uh, of these. The Suffolk Bank in Boston. Uh, what's interesting about this is not the overall design because it's not that innovative. He was sort of copying a bunch of other uh, commercial bank buildings from the time but the introduction of the shops at the first floor level as an economic, uh, uh, you know, income producing uh, feature of this bank design. But uh, again, he has the uh, parts of the uh, classical architecture uh, perfectly balanced and composed and creating these really elegant uh, facades. And, uh, here we start to work in, he's starting to work in the South a bit more, 
because of his reputation with the Tremont Hotel, many people were clamoring to have uh, hotels designed by him. Uh, this is uh, an example where we see that bayed, shallow bay uh, architecture. Here there are double bays facing the street. And um, again, ionic, um, ionic columns uh, surrounded by ante at the ends, making this sort of almost cinemagraphic display. If you go back to, the, you, could, you could see he's working on it here too, where uh, you have the columns and the ante or the pilasters at the edges forming this scene. Here it is. And then the other thing about this, uh, if you start to think about the Ohio State Capitol, uh, I think we see a little bit of connection there in a building that comes around uh, a couple of decades later. Okay, uh, well, so this is a good time to mention sort of a compromising aspect of the work of um, Rogers. He was considered a really principled man, a good person with good intentions towards everyone who was upstanding. His diaries were filled with ethical dilemmas and observations and kindness. I mean, he really seemed like a genuinely kind person. However, he lived in a time when enslaved people were abused, mistreated, and exploited. And his work in the South almost certainly relied upon the labor of enslaved people to build it. And since he was both an architect and a builder, he benefited uh, from this. And I'll, there's no indication that he was a slave owner, but I'm sure his practice profited from enforced labor. Um, his work on a rice mill for a plantation owner in Virginia uh, caught the attention of Theodore Wells uh, in his landmark exposition on the harsh realities of slavery. I don't know if you know this book or not, but um, I came across it when we were trying to save uh, the church in Walnut Hills that was connected to the Lane Theological Seminary. Uh, Theodore Weld was the student that organized a lot of that. And then later in life with his uh, wife uh, and her sister, the Grimke sisters, uh, they created this book called Slavery, American Slavery as it is, a testimony of a thousand witnesses. And what they did is they just took newspaper articles from Southern newspapers, which actually kind of put out what was happening between uh, plantation owners and slaves in a horrific uh, um, exposition. I mean, I, I have trouble reading this book and it, it's uh, very common. If you think you know what slavery treatment was like, you don't. And they didn't editorialize about it other than selecting the passages, but um, they're, you know, by their own voice to give Northern people uh, an idea of what was going on. But anyway, Isaiah Rogers earned a passage in this book. Uh, and uh, I think we have to keep that in mind as we look at it, not so much to, to condemn him in particular, but to understand the culture and society that he was working with them. And I should add that his son and son-in-law were once run out of Louisville by an angry mob of people who were shouting, damn abolitionists. So it's not so simple and we're 180 years out, but you know, as an organization, we've committed to present a more complete story of how we got here, how we got where we are today. And I think it's important to acknowledge the roots of the injustice that you know, we see today when we come across it in our history. So um, I'll leave you to go find your um, Isaiah Rogers entry in uh, uh, American slavery, because I don't like uh, reading those things. Um, so anyway, back to capitalism. Uh, this is the Merchants Exchange building in Boston, a uh, pretty significant commission for Rogers. Uh, his commissions were growing in size and importance. Here he used a temple front approach to design the exchange. It's you know, sort of hemmed in by the existing building at the time, but uh, you can see that he's uh, getting very prominent uh, commissions. And these, this, this type of building, a Merchants Exchange, becomes really important in the uh, next few um, phases of his career. So on the success of Tremont House and the other buildings that are going on, John Jacob Astor hired him to do the Astor House in New York. Uh, they said that Astor's theory of being rich was keep everything you have. Uh, and then at some point he changed it 
to, you know, okay, spend some money to show people how much money you have. And the Astor House was part of the, that phase. Uh, he hired Rogers to do the greatest hotel in the country, 1832 to 36. And, um, Rogers complied, and it, it, it was considered the uh, best hotel in the country. An interesting little note on this, uh, a group of architects tried to form a national organization. It later became the American Institute of Architects, but this was an earlier kind of failed attempt. They were calling it the American Institution of Architects. Uh, but they met in the 1840s, and they met at this hotel. Uh, Isaiah Rogers was there. He hosted them. It must have been very nice for him to have all of the most uh, important architects of the country uh, gathering in, in his building. Um, I don't know if it didn't work because they didn't get the wording right, but later the American Institute of Architects was founded and uh, we'll have a little more on that later. Rogers was not part of the second round of that because it happened in the 18, uh, it happened when he was in Cincinnati. Um, all right, so working in New York with the Astor House, uh, and finishing the Boston uh, Merchants Exchange gets him this phenomenal commission, the Merchants Exchange building at 55, uh, 55 Wall Street. It was probably one of the major commissions of his career and uh, all uh, Quincy Granite, which probably made uh, Solomon Willard happy, but uh, he's, it was designed in the Greek Revival style with a colonnade of 12 massive granite iconic columns all carved from single blocks of stone. It was constructed, uh, finished in 1842, and uh, the Merchants Exchange was the first tenant. It came right up to the street, one of the most impressive uh, monumental buildings in America, certainly the most uh, monumental commercial building. And um, it was so good, in fact, that in 1904, uh, they hired Kim Mead and White to add another version of it on top. But Kim Mead and White took off the top floor of Rogers building and then added a, uh, another colonnaded structure uh, to uh, double the size of the building. Uh, the second tier of columns is Corinthian. And uh, again, they are, they are all granite. Um, it had a vaulted ceiling that's 60 feet tall. The banking hall was the largest in the United States. Uh, it was the banking hall was later turned into a ballroom and uh, the upper floors were used as office. So, oh, oh, sorry. We, you have to know where your cursor is when you scroll. Um, I don't know what we missed. We didn't miss anything. So here's Isaiah Rogers at the time. The Merchant Exchange subsequently housed the New York Stock Exchange for about 12 years. It was a U.S. Customs House when the uh, new, the one that another when a different one was being built. So uh, the upper floors were converted to a hotel uh, for just a short time in um, around the year 2000. That didn't work, and then it is now residential units on the second floor. Uh, but uh, it became a National Historic Landmark in, seven, in 1978. Okay, so during this booming period uh, of his career, when he's having this, all of this success, uh, a real tragedy struck uh, his family. He and his wife, Emily, had eight children. And in 1838, four of the eight children died of smallpox in a two-week period. It just really shocked me when I heard this. I mean, we're kind of used to people dying, you know, in, in history at least, uh, cholera epidemics, yellow fever, smallpox. But um, how he went on from this and how his wife went on from this, I have no idea. But uh, that happened in 1838. Um, he continued getting work in Boston at the same time he was uh, growing his practice nationally and uh, focusing on New York. But here's the Harvard uh, Astronomical Observatory in 1843. Uh, this was a chance for him to combine a lot of his interests. I didn't really cover this enough, but he was, he was very interested in uh, technology and engineering. And uh, he was interested in science. He, he had broad interests. I didn't really want to put it that way. Like when, when he came to Cincinnati, he immediately sought out all the books on um, uh, Native 
Native American culture, and he would go visit any um, mound sites that he could find. But here he had a chance to combine his interest in engineering, technology, science, and architecture in a state-of-the-art facility. And it's pretty amazing when you look at those foundations that they made for the uh, telescopes to be mounted upon. But uh, his work at Harvard is no longer visible. It got assumed by other renovations, and um, so you really can't see it. But the exterior of the building is a pure Palladian villa scheme. It's uh, as close as he came to emulating the architecture of Andre Palladio, who uh, created the villas around Vicenza in the 15, uh, six, uh, around 15, uh, 1525, 1550. But uh, here he has the, the central pediment block with the low wings or hyphens going out to the side, connecting to dependencies at the outer edges. This is similar to what uh, Thomas Jeffrey used at Monticello. The Palladian theme would come up over and over again in Roger's work, whether in this sort of open spatial version or in a more compressed urban uh, version where it had to just happen within the plane of the building. And um, these forms were, were used by a lot of people. Um, this is a Palladian, a five-part Palladian villa that um, I designed. I'm uh, apologizing for sneaking in an example, but I do think it uh, shows the um, the form that both Palladio and uh, Isaiah Rogers, and actually many other architects, have uh, used over the time of the central mass, the hyphen, and the dependencies, all sort of making a single composition. And in this case, it has the sort of Bay, uh, Bode hyphen from the Villa Emo and uh, some of other Claudio's work. Okay, enough cheating. My own work in. Um, that was the only one. I won't do any more. Uh, this is uh, so. Now we arrive in Cincinnati. <clears throat> Isaiah Rogers was called to Cincinnati in 1848 by A. B. Coleman to just to design and build the Burnham House. Uh, they, again, it, you know, the city wanted to have a premier hotel. And um, so they wanted to go to the premier hotel architect. It was a way of putting yourself on the map. Coleman had worked for uh, John Jacob Astor at the Astor House. So he was the perfect person to put this project together. It was on the site of uh, Judge Barnett's house and uh, at the corner of Third and Vine Street, which is now um, City Club Apartments, uh, part of the Central Union Life Annex that has been beautifully renovated as a historic tax project. Um, but anyway, the city was trying to, it was undergoing this profound transformation from a frontier outpost to a city of commerce and manufacturing and culture. Uh, the population in 1840 was 46,000 people and it grew to 160,000 in 20 years by uh, 1860. So when you think of that, that's a 400% growth if Cincinnati was going to do that from where we are now, we'd go from 300,000 to 1.2 million. So you can just see, you know, what, what was happening at the time in the city. It was a really exciting place. I think that's partly why Rogers was uh, able to come out here to do the building and stay, uh, which he did. He had offices in the Bernard House for years um, and uh, uh, based a practice that was uh, nationwide out of Cincinnati. With riverboat traffic and railroad connections, it was a, a good place for him to do that from. He uh, had so much work in Louisville at one time that he opened a second office there that we were hearing about earlier. Uh, uh, and that firm is uh, a descendant firm of that firm is still in existence. But anyway, the Bernard House was, as I said, it's on Third and Vine, and it became one of the premier hotels in mid 19th century America. It faced the river. It was raised up and you see that it had shops at the ground level and all the major functions were um, up at the next level. Uh, so it really marked the emergence of Cincinnati as a national city. Although we ranked six in population in 1948, we still carried the baggage of being a frontier outpost. So the national claim it had really helped change, change that and elevate Cincinnati into the ranks of sort of so-called cultured cities. Uh, it was, uh, it was demolished in 1926 for um, the Central Trust Annex. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second. 
but they used it as a place for all the civic celebrations. Here they're celebrating the completion of the railroad, which uh, since the city of Cincinnati still owns, I think. Um, and here you can see it later in the 19th century. We know this is after um, um, you can see H.H. H. Richardson's building in the background here, the Chamber of Commerce building, which was done in the 1890s, and uh, the hotel in the, in the front. So we get to see a little bit of Richardsonian Romanesque sort of overpowering uh, the Greek revival buildings of a simpler era. There's a lot more manifest destiny in the Richardsonian ones. And the interior of the Bernard House uh, Hotel, uh, you can see A.B. Coleman, the proprietor on the uh, menu. But uh, take a look at this mirror over here. These are very big, by the way. I know because um, one of the mirrors from the Bernard House, and not that one exactly, because it, does, it has a different top, but one of those mirrors was moved to a music hall after uh, the Bernard House was uh, torn down. And it stayed in, in music hall until the recent renovations when the Friends of Music Hall and CPA helped get the mirror back to the Central Trust Annex, back onto the site of the original hotel with a very nice plaque marking, uh, you know, what it is. But uh, they're really heavy. The owners of the hotel were very happy to get it, even though moving it is very, very difficult. Uh, so when they tore the hotel down, you know, it was past its prime. It was still a great building, but um, these things go out of, style and uh, they, uh, they had a, a big party to celebrate the demolition. Uh, there was a white marble staircase that um, uh, the owner of the Central Trust um, insurance company took a hammer to as the highlight of the party. They had guests dressed up like some of the famous hotel guests like uh, Abraham Lincoln and Grant, Jenny Lynn and P.T. Barnum, Barnum were regular guests at the hotel. Um, Okay, so uh, I said that Isaiah Rogers had a whole uh, range of interests. And one of them that stayed with him his entire life and especially picked up near the end of his life was an interest in engineering and bridges. First of all, he did not like suspension bridges. Uh, he had seen a couple of them collapse and uh, thought the whole idea was ludicrous. And he, there's no record of him meeting Roebling even though he was in town at the time of uh, Roebling's work for our bridge. And he was certainly in New York uh, uh, later when uh, Roebling was doing the Brooklyn Bridge. But uh, he created, uh, Rogers created this incredible lattice bridge uh, and um, he got a patent for it. And they found out sort of recently that he actually constructed two of them. One was a 70 foot span, 10 feet in diameter of intersecting helixes at an exhibition in Boston in, for, in 1841. And it was a hit of the fair, 80,000 people went to it. And uh, he won the gold medal and it, you know, everybody was really excited about it. And uh, then a year later, he actually built one in, in, in uh, Cincinnati at the Bernard House connecting rooms, across, connecting across the courtyard. I've never seen any pictures of that. I couldn't find any, but uh, anyway. It was a very interesting bridge design, uh, really innovative. And in 19, in the 1980, or 2010, um, Bernard Tashumi did this one in Paris uh, based on the same principles that, uh, of Roger's tubular truss bridge. Um, now I'm gonna kind of go quickly through this one. It's the Hamilton County Courthouse. And you know, we've had a lot of them, okay? This is number four. And now I think we're on number six. But uh, there was a competition to design the Hamilton County Courthouse and uh, Rogers entered the competition. He didn't win. And I, to tell you the truth, I really, could, uh, at this point, can't tell you quite what happened, but eventually it was done according to his design, but Walter and Wilson uh, won the competition to build the building I think to uh, Isaiah Rogers' designs, because if you look at that design and remember a few things about it, you can forget get the dome. The dome did not get built. But uh, if it had, I mean, 
what a magnificent county courthouse. I can't believe, I mean, what they were thinking was amazing. Um, but at any rate, uh, Rogers was trying to give them, you know, some amazing uh, stature here. But the one that got built was very similar to uh, Rogers design and he ended up being the one to finish it. Now with these competitions, there's a pattern here where somebody wins, but it wasn't their design. And so somebody else has to build it and then they keep firing them and then things happen over decades and then the original people come back in. But in this case, Rogers did finish the construction of it. And if we go back to his competition entry, uh, it really looks very much like his design was the one that was built. So I'll pick up the pace here a little. I'm, oh, 649. Okay, Diane, am I missing like faint, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down or should I take a breath to see? Is my, spe is my speaker on? We can all, we can all hear you. And this has been going really well, I don't know. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure I hadn't like come unplugged. Nope, right. you're, you're good. Okay, I'll pick up the pace, okay? So, uh, that county courthouse that Isaiah Rogers designed uh, was the one that was burned in the 1884 riot. Uh, people weren't happy with a, uh, a verdict of uh, a murder case and they rioted, they burned the courthouse down. And um, let's see. And here we are a few days after, it went on for three days. Uh, a lot of people were killed, state, uh, Militia and National Guard were called in. Here they are defending the sort of ruins of the building. And then this is a committee inspecting the ruins shortly thereafter. And I, you just, I can't get over, you know, their face and what they, you know, they just, the building wasn't really very old and uh, it was supposed to be fireproof. And you can see the result there. Um, again, I said these buildings, important public buildings end up being backdrops and stage for moments of, uh, you know, uh, turmoil and, and uh, social change. Uh, and anyway, we have uh, the replacement building was done by the firm of James W. McLaughlin in 1885, and it incorporated some of the outstanding walls that had been left by from Isaiah Rogers buildings. If you look at the side elevation here, all of those pilasters and that and, and the cornice and all of that work is left over, and then they put on this. Uh, uh, different facade, which really wasn't very well received at the time. I don't know if people still had the memory of the other one or the style was too progressive or too um, uh, exotic, but uh, it was not uh, particularly well liked. And in 1918, that building was taken down and uh, the one that was currently on site was built by Rankin, Kellogg and Crane. Okay, so, uh, and, you know, it sort of harkens back a little bit to Roger's design on that. Uh, Rogers and his son did these amazing uh, buildings at uh, Longview Asylum. Uh, there was a statewide program of trying to improve the conditions in the asylums and out in Carthage. These were built. Uh, they were uh, thought, you know, supposed to be very healthy and scientifically worked out. But again, you know, they became overpopulated, underfunded, and uh, conditions became, uh, de degenerated very well. Plus, it was on the Mill Creek, which was not a um, very healthy place for it to be. So for a variety of reasons, they didn't achieve what they set out to. But Rogers and his son uh, did these toward the end of his career, coming up to 1860. And uh, the Ohio uh, State Capitol competition is another one of these uh, sort of messes that resulted in a very nice building, but uh, the competition itself is a disaster. The, you could probably do several lectures on that. And, I'm not from Ohio. You probably all learned the story of it in high school or grade school or something. I'm from Indiana. So what I learned in grade school was that uh, the Indianapolis 500 has 200 laps. But uh, anyway, would have been good to learn the story of the Ohio State Capitol. Uh, Isaiah Rogers entered the competition in 1838. He didn't win. Oh, 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 oh back. he did not win. Uh, he didn't come in the top three. Uh, but by the end of the project in 1861, he was the supervising architect and some of his design elements found their way in. But uh, the state credits about four different firms uh, with the architecture of this. And um, if you wanna really go back to sort of the DNA of the architecture, you have to uh, go back to the French architect and theorist, Claude Nicole Ledoux, who, um, 
created this design in 1763, and it, it became so well known and admired by architects at the time as uh, sort of this really powerful rendition of classicism uh, that a lot of the entries had it as their sort of starting point. Here is the winning entry by Henry Waller, Walter, and uh, second place, Thomas, uh, Martin Thomas. So uh, you see various elements of Ledoux's uh, uh, building in that and in many of the other entries. But uh, so what happened is Walter won, they gave him the commission, but said, we're not sure about your design. The design committee went to New York to talk to A.J. Davis, who had been in the competition and didn't win. Davis and Town did many of the uh, state capitals around the country. They ended up not getting this one. But they asked him his opinion, and there was a third place entry that uh, Davis uh, said they should consider. And uh, the third place was by the artist, uh, Hudson River School artist, Thomas Cole. He entered an architectural rendering and came in third. Cole had had a nephew who worked for Isaiah Rogers. He wasn't working for him at the time. And Cole kind of advertised himself as artist architect. Uh, so anyway, his design uh, later ended up being the one that most uh, completely influenced what Walter had to build. So uh, Walter won, but he has to build Cole's plan. And Cole's plan is uh, hinted at in Cole's great painting, The Architect's Dream of 1840. This is sort of two years after the competition. Uh, you can see their hints of the drum and the uh, arcade uh, that are in the Ohio Capitol. There's a whole other angle to this story, which it was commissioned by Eli Town, who was Davis's partner, and he didn't accept it because he said it was just architecture, it wasn't a painting. And uh, I don't know if having lost a call uh, affected whether he accepted the commission of the painting or not. Uh, so as I Rogers finished the Capitol, he was supervising architect. I don't think it was that rewarding for him. Uh, he did a lot to the interiors and he did a little to the dome. He was probably hired as a sort of conservative, knows how to get it done uh, on time and on budget at this point in his career. Uh, and um, he, he finished the work. Uh, anyway, um, James O. Gordon picks out a really great quote from the diaries. And he you know, sort of saying, well, we're not sure what, what uh, Rogers thought about the building when he was done. But he said, he notes in his diary on a trip to Columbus after it's finished, walked over to the Capitol, saw it. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's possible it wasn't a good experience. He could have been referring to his whole experience with the bell. Okay, so now we're uh, becoming much more concrete here. This is the George Hatch House on Dayton Street. Hatch was mayor of the city. He was a land uh, investor and he hired Rogers to do a house for him. It was very expensive at the time. I think it was called Hatch's Folly, um, but it's really a magnificent work. And uh, that's a picture I took a few days ago. Um, and um, it has the, again, the double bayed uh, architecture and it has pieces from um, the, the book by Stuart and Revit that were explicitly drawn from the Temple of the Winds I'll show you that in a second. But um, this building set the stage for Dayton Street to become Millionaire's Row. It was kind of on the outskirts at the time, uh, 18, 1850. So I put those dates up there so I remember them. But um, anyway, uh, so it, it has a little bit of Italianate architecture coming into it. The plan's symmetrical, but uh, the limestone facade has this wonderful sense of motion from the bowed bays and they're integrated with a central porch, and it's more compressed. Everything is really coming together here in a way that has a lot more intensity than some of the earlier examples, like such as the Tremont House or uh, the Richmond Merchants Exchange, which also had the double bays, but they weren't, they weren't engaged as part of a complete ensemble. Uh, the central section here really reinforces the facade's movement with that bayed entrance porch, and it's, you know, kind of sparse ornamentation, sparse design. It's really letting the forms be the um, architectural statement. Um, okay, so the house was documented by the Historic American Building Survey, which by the way, is what Denny Myers ran for many years. Denny Myers was with the uh, uh, Secretary of Interior's office. He was uh, in charge of HABs. He's the one that discovered Isaiah Rogers' diaries 
and he worked in museums in Ohio um, and has a lot of really good articles that I drew from on this. But here are the drawings and the floor plans. Again, uh, the stair here is a little different than uh, Roger's earlier stairs. This one's squared, but it is, uh, again, a, a major feature of the house. The interiors, and uh, again, these are the Historic American Building Survey photographs. And if you're ever working on a historic structure and you're lucky enough to have had um, it surveyed, they're available in the Library of Congress and they're really good, very high quality. And they record buildings at a time before uh, they might've been renovated or damaged. Again, I, I really like this one because you can see the interaction of those elements that are making the, uh, the bays and then the, um, uh, check them out. The ironwork was designed by Rogers and it's been replicated. Uh, a lot of it was missing, but I think what is there now is uh, very good replications of it. But I just wanna show you this little front porch. It, you know, it looks like it's bowing out, but it's actually a hex, hexagonal space behind it. It's sort of concealed and really clever planning. Um, and again, this comes from uh, Stuart and Re Revit, uh, those books that architects would go to. And you can see how they could do it now when you look at what the drawings are. You know, they're very, uh, they're beautiful the way they have a plan, section, profile, elevation, everything you need. There's so much information in these. Um, but uh, let's see. So their, their description of the Temple of the Winds, only one row of anthocanthus leaves above which is another row of palm leaves. There are no volutes and the abacus is square rather than concave. So, so if you look at that in the corner and you um, look at uh, the, the square version that um, Rogers did, this is exactly where he's getting that work. Uh, Habs did the entire straight uh, Hatch House isn't on that, but, but the John Halk House is. It's, a, it's a, this one right here. And we're very proud. Cincinnati Preservation owns that house. So this is what uh, the street became after the, after the uh, uh, Hatch House was done. And this is the Halk House facade, which Cincinnati Preservation Association owns this. We've been restoring it with the help of Ken Hughes, our incredible craftsman restoration uh, expert. And, uncovering murals on the walls and decorative uh, paintings that we can't wait to show to the public. Uh, we hope to be doing much more with the house uh, in starting as soon as people are getting out again. Uh, okay, very quickly, I'll finish up. This is uh, another house uh, for, for uh, this is a house for Reuben Reeser in uh, 1860 on Cornell Place. It was one of these lucky discoveries that came out of the diaries because it, he described that he had a house for Ruben Reeser on Cornell Place. And I walked over there, it's not far from where I live, and took these pictures the other day. Uh, it's now apartments, but it's really, the exterior is really intact. Uh, Isaiah Rogers did this form uh, sort of in this uh, castellated, goth, uh, castellated Italianate style. And here it is in its earlier days. I thought it was interesting to look at this stair. It's picking up the end of the cross axis uh, a way that's similar to the Tremont house. Uh, and then out in Aurora, Indiana, the house, uh, which is called Hill Forest, it's the Thomas Gaff's house, was built by Isaiah Rogers in 1855. Uh, the diary pages for this are hilarious. He takes the steamboat out, pays 50 cents, I think, for the ride, meets Mr. Gaff, they go look at the site, he likes it, picks some wildflowers. Good. Anyway, goes away and two days later, he sends the plans back to Gaff for the house. Now those aren't the complete everything plans, but still. Um, it's a, it, it, Gaff made his money with uh, distilleries and riverboat transportation. So I think uh, there's a little bit, probably the best intact uh, Isaiah Rogers stair is at the house. And the house itself is one of the most intact Isaiah Rogers properties in the country. It's a National Historic Landmark. It's very well maintained, managed, and interpreted by the uh, Hill Forest Historical Foundation. And some of their members are here tonight. Uh, we might hear from them. But uh, it's open to the public uh, when they're not pandemics, but um, we will hear about that. Anyway, here's the house. So very little of his work remains today. You know, and um, it highlights to me the importance of preservation's role, ensuring that architects from the past is maintained and protected and utilized. We're really lucky to have a few of the remaining works of Isaiah Rogers, and we're even more lucky that some of them are cared for by groups like the Hill Forest Historical Foundation. 
So Rogers gets to Washington in 1862. I'm not going to tell you anything about this because nothing really came of it. I mean, Samuel Chase appointed him. He was architect of the treasury and um, uh, all of his work has been assumed by other work. He was finishing uh, buildings and um, and he also designed the Robert Bowler House in where Mount Storm Park is. Adolf Strauch had done the amazing landscape gardens there and Rogers did the house. Uh, I think he renovated a small frame house that was there. Um, but anyway, this became somewhat of a controversy in 1812 when the family gave it to the park board to become a park and vandals would get into the house and uh, apparently teenagers were having trice, whatever those are. So the park board had to tear it down. And uh, what I was interested in was that Samuel Iglauer, and if there are any people with that name on the phone on the, on the call and want to give me the correct pronunciation, but Samuel Iglauer was a doctor. He had saved the James Kemper house a few years before, but in 1917, he pleaded with the commissioners not to destroy it. I think we need to make a, a Samuel Iglauer award at CPA for citizen activism, but they were doing that in 1917. Uh, the Kemper log cabin was he saved it to the Cincinnati Zoo and then Miami Purchase, which is our organization, had it moved to Sharon Woods Village where it is today. Um, this building is at Mount Storm Park and it's attributed to uh, Adolf Strauch in some places and in others to Isaiah Rogers. Now, I, I don't know. I don't know enough about Adolf Strauch's structures. You know, I know he did Spring Grove Cemetery and uh, designed many things for that. Uh, but when I look at some of Isaiah Rogers' Corinthian column detailing, I really wonder if uh, the temple uh, isn't related to that. Um, so I'm just going to keep going here. I, I wanted a picture of it and I didn't, I didn't have a chance to go out, so I used an old one I have. I did not take my dog and myself specifically for this. But um, okay, I'm going to skip this part about links to the past are so important. We can do that at another time, but preservation really does connect us to things, and I would have liked to have been able to tell you about that. Um, Diane, I'm seeing that I'm at 7.05. I will skip uh, the tombs. And it's a complicated story about A.B. Coleman's tomb, which has the name of Marsh on it, and he apparently made two of them. So. And then these are some tombs that he designed for his friends. And this is his own resting place in Spring Grove Cemetery with his son. Uh, Willard is also buried there and his wife and family. <laughs> I say Rogers at the end of his life, he didn't have enough to do. And he was kind of bored. I mean, not bored, but depressed. And there were no commissions. So he started designing bridges and he went to New York and tried to design a replacement for the road. He was trying to oust Roebling for the bridge to Brooklyn. Uh, he wanted to do it with his iron designs. But uh, his son, Willard Rogers, went on to become a founding member of AIA Cincinnati, which there he is. Uh, these people are signing the AIA Cincinnati Charter in 1870. So if you do the math, since AIA Cincinnati is celebrating its 150th anniversary this year. So happy anniversary. Oh, Diane, are you telling me I'm too long? I'll finish. You're, you're almost done. You're okay. <laughs> I'm almost done. But I just wanted to say happy birthday to AIA Cincinnati. And um, okay, so finally. Here he is at the three stages of his life. And I left off Thomas Cole's Voyages of Life photographs that I had superimposed over these. I thought that was too 19th century romanticism. But anyway, when Roger, this is my conclusion, and I will stop. When, when Rogers moved to Cincinnati, he was highly successful on a national level by any standard. The success of the Tremont House in 1928 established him as a leading hotel architect and cities across the country were asking him for hotel designs, much like countries around the world were asking Frank Gehry for their own Bellbound museums. He may not have intended to make Cincinnati his home. He did though, and uh, we're better off for it. And finally, to bring the discussion up to date, classicism has this long winding course in American architectural history and Rogers is a key figure in that. Recently, the misguided attempt to have Classical architecture declared the only accepted federal style uh, uh, style for federal buildings backfired, and rightly so. For all its beauty and placemaking qualities, I think classical architecture lacks the relevance to diverse communities that a pluralistic society needs. Like many architects of his era, 
Rogers used the forms of ancient Greece to project an image of stability, cultivation, and public-minded citizenship for his clients. Yet in many cases, this masks the underlying realities of how their wealth was acquired or how it was maintained. In some cases, this included wealth acquired at the expense of enslaved people. I think it's important for us to keep in mind this big picture when we think about American history. The act of presenting history, or in this case, the work of an architect, can itself uh, imply honor and it can implicitly glorify it. And some of that's fine when there are positive aspects to people's lives, like Isaiah Rogers certainly had. But I hope we can find ways to go beyond that, to develop a more complete understanding of our past, acknowledging the injustice when it's in, which was embedded within that society so that we have at least a small way to start reflecting on how it continues in our time. Thanks very much for listening, and I hope you know a little more about Isaiah Rogers. That's it. Thank you. I will stop my share. That was fantastic, Paul. I know that you've told me a couple of facts about Isaiah Rogers over the past week or so, but I learned so much more um, during that discussion, so thank you. Um, we did have a, quite a few questions come through the chat, uh, and I know, folks, we still have quite a few of our uh, participants here. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to keep throwing them in there. I have a list of the questions that have come through so far, so I can get to the newer questions uh, towards the end. Um, one of the first questions was, is the, the Tremont House still standing? No. no. The Tremont House is not there. Um, and yeah, that was a beautiful, beautiful building. Um, then Fred Warren asked uh, to Actually, he let us know that the Weld's book is available at the Harriet Beecher Stowe House. So it's available oh. locally here in Cincinnati. Um, and then I believe it was Cindy Schutt, uh, of the executive director of the Health Force, and we're so glad that you were able to join us, you and, and your docents as well. Um, I know you did mention that the hours of Health Force are Tuesday through Sunday, 11 to 3. Um, while I still have everybody, and as you're thinking about questions, if you have any, I do want to mention um, that on Tuesday, July 7th, this is next week at 6 p.m., we are doing another virtual lecture. Uh, this time, as I mentioned at the top of the lecture, it's going to be on the oldest buildings in Cincinnati. Margot will be our director of education, is going to give the talk. She is going to uh, walk through all the buildings that she knows that are the oldest. I'm sure that many of you out there also know some old buildings in Cincinnati. Uh, so we're going to have a really good time with that. I'm looking forward to it. And, um, and I'm glad that everyone on this on this call was able to join. I don't see any more uh, questions coming through. I really hope that we see all of you uh, next week's lecture. Uh, we will be sending out a survey after this uh, call, and sometime it'll probably be tomorrow, um, with a request for any topics that you are interested in uh, learning about. As we look at these virtual lectures, we really want to find topics that everybody um, finds interesting and we want to learn together. So uh, look, look out for that, and uh, we will see you all soon. Thank you for coming.